Welcome and good morning. It's good to be together. We are in uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. Just about finished this week and then next week we'll finish up this series. And then who knows what's going to happen. I have an idea, but we'll see. We're going to end the year with one called Alpha and Omega. The beginning and the end. So once we're ready with our slides there, if you've got your Bibles open, uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, page 1830, if you're using one of our guest Bibles. The tie-in from last week, this week we're talking about our thoughts from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Last week we talked about a command because it is a present active imperative. This is what you are to do. Do you remember what the command was? In all of that section, there was one that said, stand firm. But then the passage says, therefore, this is how you stand firm. And gave us the reasons, the, the process of being able to stand firm in the Lord, which is a, always an important and uh, applicable text in any day, in any age. This week, the sermon focuses on a specific area where we need to stand firm in the Lord, by the guidance of Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to be thinking about our thoughts. Who remembers the Caramel commercial? Think, 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 that's all I do. I just remember that line over and over. Think, 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 that's all I do. We're going to be thinking about thought. How do you stand firm in the Lord? Well, part of it is controlling and being aware of what we think and, and how we think, what our thought process is. Begin with a few quotes about thinking. Oswald Chambers said, As long as the devil can keep us terrified of thinking, he will always limit the work of God in our souls. Amen. Lazy faith is an unthinking faith. One of the great aspects of Christianity is it stands up to questioning, doesn't it? Our faith actually becomes stronger because we can examine, we can in interrogate, we can go through and say, well, why does it say that? And it stands up to the testing, and it's in the process of questioning our faith that our faith actually develops. It's unique in that because it will hold to any test. Thomas Traherne said, as nothing is more easy than to think, so nothing is more difficult than to think well. Again, that you can think, but are you really thinking and deeply thinking? and investigating and examining and putting the, the effort into your thought process. James Allen said, good thoughts bear good fruit, bad thoughts bear bad fruit, and man is his own gardener. I think Zig Ziglar said the same sort of thing. Positive thought, the power of positive thought. But it's the idea that you get to choose what you're sowing, therefore what you're reaping. And the, the negativity, the, the doubts, the, the fears, the concern, the accusation, the condemnation that Satan wants you to plant. God says, trust, believe, hope, patience, goodness, kindness. Plant those things and reap that harvest. We do have a choice in our thought process process and we must exercise that right to choose as we develop Christian character. It comes from the thought process of choice. We're also called to think theologically. It's not just the ability to think, we have the choice in what to think. In religion, the choice of what to think is called doctrine. Our doctrine is developed through our theology. Theology is our study of God. Just like we have biology and we have other ologies. Well, theology is the study of God. If he is who he is, then that impacts who we are because of that thought process. We live the way that we live because God is the way that he is, thus honoring the call to be holy. But why? Because I am holy. If God is this way, then we are that way too. And for us, it influences all kinds of things, including our worship service. Because God removed the physical elements of the Old Testament worship, he removed the instruments, the temple, the incense, we choose to worship through singing, with God in us as his temple, 
and offering prayers to him as spiritual incense. So the physical gets transitioned into a spiritual application of the same physical. But there is a reason the physical were removed. Theologically, centering our worship differently. Be holy as I am holy is a theologically centered thought process. But so is how we've decided how to worship. The Christian thinker challenges current prejudices. Any of our students would agree with that? The Christian thinker challenges current prejudices, disturbs the complacent, obstructs the busy pragmatists, questions the very foundation of all about him, and is a nuisance. Because when you stand for your faith, when you question the thought process of others, why they say the things that they say, why they make these blanket statements about all of the sciences, for example, social construct, why they just make these statements and you say, well, where does that come from? When you question that thought process, you become the underlined red part. You are now a nuisance. As long as everybody just goes along, but Christianity doesn't necessarily fit with everything. And so it becomes countercultural. That is because we think differently. But we also think what is true, what is helpful, what is inspiring, what is necessary, what is kind. Think before you speak. Christianity does that. Our view of Christ. If we're going to follow who Jesus is, and be that light and salt to the world around us, it involves a thought process. This comes very late in the discussion in Philippians. But thought is, the, is a main aspect of Christianity. Mom, you writing that down? I'll pause for a minute. Everybody think about mom. <laughs> writing that down, how much time she might need. Any more? <laughs> the thought process. You know the passage we're going to. Whatever. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever. Whatever. Think about whatever. But there's a important aspects of think about whatever is in all of that passage. That's where we're going. In cognitive therapy we say that our thoughts create feelings. Our feelings create behavior and our behavior reinforces thoughts. So learning to examine and adjust our thinking changes our self-view, changes our interaction with the world, and it changes our life patterns. That's why in counseling, the process is, what's the pattern? Why do you think this way? What reinforces those thoughts? How do we adjust that thought process so that we create other feelings and other behaviors? We, um, we're going to talk about the word, don't be anxious in the passage, because what does that mean? Why that word, and is that the best translation of the concept that's going in here? You agree? Thought create feeling? You ever thought something, you felt it, and it was wrong? Somebody cut you off, you thought, well, they cut me off, but they didn't. It was a different motive, and all of a sudden your feelings can change because you see it differently. Thought creates feelings. Feelings create behavior. Behavior reinforces thoughts. That then goes back to... And so if you can interrupt that thought process and think differently, it can change the rest of the cycle. That's why it becomes one of the more quicker forms of counseling and more effective forms of counseling. The passage says, rejoice in the Lord whenever you want. Or does it say that? Rejoice when things are only good. Paul is writing from where? From prison. He's wondering if he's going to make it out. And if he dies, is the church going to be okay? Pretty big thoughts, right? Pretty big concerns about somebody that has invested his life in all of these people. And there's a lot of negative things going on in his life at that point. But he wants them to think theologically. So the command is rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts 
in your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen to this passage? Is this not like a powerful memory passage to go back to when things are tough and when we're struggling? Rejoice in the Lord always. Don't be anxious about anything. Present your requests to God. The peace of God will do what? Will guard your heart and your mind. Our hearts and our minds need guarded sometimes because we're under that attack, sometimes by our own thought process. So some of the things that he's mentioning here is there is a call to rejoice. You see that? Rejoice when? Always. The call is to rejoice always. Paul is leading the congregation into some actions and attitudes that need to, develop, need to be developed. They are called to rejoice. No matter the circumstance in life, as we are in Christ, we have reason to rejoice. Not only do we know that all of our blessings come from God, which gives us reasons to rejoice, we also know that even in the worst of times, we can trust that only God can make good come out of them. Amen? And so we rejoice that the bad in life only lasts for a while and that our hope is eternal. He then calls them to an action of, the second virtue is gentleness. Involved is the willingness to yield one's personal right and to show consideration and care to others. It's easy to display this quality to some people. We like to be kind and compassionate to some people, but he doesn't call us to be compassionate to some. It's compassionate to all. To all, to Christian friends, unsafe persecutors, false teachers, anyone at all. And as Paul's in prison, it might be to the guards, might be to the... But he says, be compassionate, be gentle to all. Now is the time for good works, and as he says, to work out your salvation, to make sure that that changes who you are. The next item is in the negative form first. He says we need to be free of anxiety. Anxiety is fretfulness, undue care, and replace that with, instead of anxiety, call to pray and be thankful. Instead of wondering what's up, go to God and thank him for him being with us and through this. So I wanted to talk about anxiety. Do you have a few hours? I have a workshop we could go to. A word about anxious. Well, what's going on in the passage? How was it understood? It's a challenge because we often use the word anxious when we actually mean worry. Anxiety in itself as a clinical is different than worry because one is precognitive, before you think, and one is after or a process of thinking. So anxious is a feeling, an experience that we go through that we don't know why. What has it, something that is triggered within us before we think. Whereas worry is rehashing a negative response. So the word here is translated most often worry. In Matthew 6, do not worry, the same word, merimaneo. But here it's translated anxious, which can give us a different understanding. I don't think maybe the best because technically you can't control by thought anxiety. Does that make sense? It is a response, something you're going through. Now you can learn how to avoid that pattern a bit, but it's different than dealing with worry. Worry is rehashing, bringing up the same thoughts, negative thoughts and negative thought process. So sometimes we use the words differently. The word itself is pretty powerful. It means drawn in opposite directions, divided into parts. It means, figuratively, to go to pieces. <laughs> Does that make sense? That type of anxiety, that type of worry, where you just fall apart because you're being pulled in different directions. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to think. You don't have a sense of balance and we're pulled apart. That's how they would have understood the word. Don't be pulled apart. So anxious is precognitive. Before I think, I experience. And worry is a negative thought process. So if I was translating the sense of the passage, I would put it this way. Don't let anything pull you to pieces. Do you like that? Don't let anything pull you to pieces. Get a grip by taking your concerns to God, being thankful that he cares and he will act. Now that's not an authorized translation of anything. That's my understanding of what the passage is talking about. Don't be pulled to pieces. Don't let the worries of life 
fracture you to the point that you don't have a sense of certainty because God is always worthy of trust. So instead of being pulled apart, get your life together by focusing on God. Maybe that will help you a little bit in understanding the intent, as I see it, of the passage. The way to get unwrapped from the problems that tangle our minds is to offer them to God in prayer. God is approachable and we can be thankful for the way that he helps us handle our concerns. When we're rejoicing, we're gentle, we're free from anxiety, we're free from worry, our life is not being pulled apart, then the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds because it's found in Christ this ability to see life, even in the challenges, to see it differently. A similar thing is said in another powerful passage in Romans 12, 1 and 2. God is working at transforming our minds and we can join him in the same work. What is our response? Romans 12, 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. By having a different outlook. By having a different filter to view life then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So that's the premise to when we get to our whatever passage in verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what's our response? Think about such things. So that's said in the, neg in the positive. Look at the whole list in the negative. If it is not noble, if it is not true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, here's the question. Should you be thinking about it? No. This is only think about these things. That is, take everything and direct them to this form of thought. No matter what's going on in life, there's a way to filter it in Christ. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me, seen in me, put into practice. And by putting into practice, the God of peace will be with you. True has a sense of valid, what is reliable, what is honest, the opposite of false. Is it true? Is it a valid thought? Is it noble, quality that makes people worthy of respect? Is it a respectable thought? Is it a right thought? Is it upright or just, conforming to God's standards? Is it worthy of God's approval? Is it the way that Jesus would think? Is it pure? Moral purity includes some context, the more restricted sense of chaste, is even as pure as in sexually pure. Well, that's a whole different discussion, but a connected discussion about think about what is pure. The good things of life. Whatever's lovely, what's pleasing, agreeable, amiable, the things that bring unity instead of division, admirable, what is praiseworthy, attractive, true to the highest standards, the things that are attractive. Think about the good things, the blessings of life. Think about things that are excellent or praiseworthy, things that lead you to rejoicing in God. And there's a number of ways to do that. It's not that we just ignore the negatives of life, but we start to view them differently and we put a lot less attention on those thoughts than we do on thoughts that God can use to bless us. Paul knows that when we continually center our minds on such thoughts as these, we'll be changed to be more like Christ. It seems like this is a way that Jesus was able to handle the challenges of life is by his thought process of thinking of things in specific ways. Not only does he call them to challenge what they think about, as in, in categories, but then he says, if you have struggle with that, look to me. Because don't we need that sometimes? Don't we need an example? Don't we need some help to see what it's like? If they've learned, received, heard, or seen these things, they should follow them and pass them on to others. It's the putting into practice, then, that the God of peace will be with them. It's one thing to say, I know I should think that way. But then it's to see, well, who does think that way? 
Who exemplifies this? Who can I learn from? Paul in this says, look at me. I've tried to learn these things in my life. If looking at me helps you, then let it help you. And we need to be that example for others. Watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. But it starts back at watch your thoughts. Because how you think and what you think about and what you focus on and what you feed into that then changes the course of the life and the decisions that you make. The way you interact with others, how you see yourself, how you see God, it goes back to your mind. Paul says it, uh, Peter says it this way, therefore prepare your minds for action. Do you like that? That's a big call to attention. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. But I like that. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled comes from a mind that's prepared for action. Be self-controlled because your hope is fully on God's grace. It's a different way of looking at it. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind. Amen? Pretty good way there's the sermon and the sentence. May the mind of the master be the master of your mind. Isn't that really what he's talking about through the whole thing? If Jesus is who he is, let him control your thoughts. Let the mind of the master be the master of your mind, and life will change. Maybe not the circumstance, maybe not the situation, but your ability to get through it does. Do you intentionally guard your mind? How do you specifically guard your mind? What patterns do you have in place for the mental attack? How do you currently filter what you think about? How do you decide is it I'm going to think about this rather than that. I'm going to focus on this rather than that. How do you evaluate your thoughts? Do you consider fairly frequently through the day, through the week, through the month, what have I been thinking about? Do you evaluate how much time and energy you spend thinking what types of things? Do you take your thoughts captive or do they take you captive? Do you find that your thoughts then run away with you, change the day, change the moment, change your week, change your relationships? Or do you know how to take captive your own thoughts so that you can lead them towards Christ? I make a pretty big, bold claim here. Summarizing maybe 18 years of preaching. Ten things. Ten life-changing habits. Most of these you already know. But they all come from this section. Ten ways that your life can be different if you put these into practice. Guess what number one is? Take note of what you fill your mind with. Your life won't change if you continually think the way that you've always thought. Make time to read the Bible. Good things in leads to garbage out. When you're filling yourself with spiritual thought, you don't have room to think about those other things. And you know what is not of the scripture. So you're able to filter life better. Monitor your conversation topics and the word choices because out of the heart the mouth speaks. Is God a part of your regular conversation? Just that change, that habit of speaking more about God, rehearsing scripture, putting God into conversation will start to change your life. So will spending time in prayer. Spending time in prayer is a change in the thought process because you're listening to what God has to say. You're in the moment. You're reflecting on what's going on inside instead of the activity of the mind. And it's a way to change who we are. Find things that are. Do you notice that that is the blue part? Find things. Don't just expect them to fall on to you. Find things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Do some digging. And think spiritually, not just physically. Don't be a, just a victim of your environment. Find things and focus on those. Spend time talking to Christians. Spend time with people that think the same way and encourage that thought process and go through it. Share positive thoughts. Dedicate your heart to God. 
Bible talks about creating me a clean heart, O oh God, from the Psalms. Ask God for that. Just wipe it clean and let's start again. That's a habit that's going to change our lives, opening ourselves up to God's evaluation. Find someone you can emulate their faith. Train your mind to think differently about yourself and others. Look through the congregation and say, who's a good example of my weakness? Say, can I learn some things from you? Can I talk to you about this? Can you show me how to be better at what? But connect and encourage one another. Practice what's been preached. And the church says, Amen. <laughs> Listen to the preaching. Why do we do this every week? Why do we do books that we do? Why do we do this? It's because God can use it to change us. Do God's word and not just listen to it. James 1.22. You notice I often have way more application than I expect you to do because I expect you to do one of it. Something triggers individually to say that's what I most need to work on. I try to be forward thinking and giving you options. Ask God to clear your mind from the filth of the world. I want you to notice that James 1.21 says, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Get rid of all moral filth, filth, humbly accept the word planted in you, comes just before the verse that says, put the preaching into practice. Before you can start applying scripture, you've got to get the other stuff out. Change that process and then start adding scripture in. Too often we try to add in application, but we haven't removed previous application. <laughs> we haven't stopped doing things, so we can't start doing new things. Those verses are in that order on purpose. Ten things that I think habits that will change your life. I see all of those within this passage. It is a call to being transformed. As we're transforming our thoughts, it will become natural and normal to think about things that God gives us that are true, that are noble, that are right, that are pure, that are lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. A few weeks, a few months down the road, it becomes much easier to think these things. But you start now with adding them in. It all happens in time. Let's go to God in prayer. As we have through this sermon series, prayer is an important aspect for us not only to communicate to God, but to, to put our thoughts together about who God is and then to listen to him as well. Let's pray. Holy and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. And we thank you for the time to come together and worship of who you are, what you have done, and what you will do. You're a God of action and we celebrate your work in our lives, in our community, in our country, in our world and in our universe. Today, as we keep our text in mind, we rejoice in you always as we turn all aspects of our lives over to your control. And when we reach out to take them back because of impatience, fear, or ignorance, we ask that you would help us to remember your faithfulness from the past and trust you in the present for the future. We thank you for our congregation and for the work that you're doing in us, through us, and around us as partners in the gospel. We pray for health, strength, growth, and energy for our congregation as we live lives in honor of your sacrifice and our calling. We thank you for all the good things in our lives and the power of focusing on you, your faithfulness, and our calling to stand firm. We know that others are watching our lives and we need, to, need your help to show them of who you are and the reason why they should put their trust in you. We thank you for your forgiveness, your grace, and your mercy. We know of the power of our thought processing. We ask you, uh, ask to seek you more clearly as we think of the things in life that are true, that are honorable, that are right, that are pure, that are pleasing, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy, so that you are praised and honored as you should be. We thank you for your written word, the work of the Holy Spirit, in the example of Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Next week, we finish up Philippians 4, 10 through 20, contentment.